So, um, operate first, how to open source. We can see you, Marcel. Yes. <laughs> I joined late, sorry. Great. Nice you. Everything you looks and good. And I can see you, that's awesome. <laughs> and now I will leave. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. So, um, operate first, how to open source cloud operations. That's a pretty big theme and it takes some time to understand what I'm talking about or what I tried. And it has multi multiple facets even, um, what we're trying to accomplish here. It took more than a year to articulate it in our teams. So I'm trying to go slow and I'm trying to focus on just some of the, one or two of the aspects. And don't worry if it doesn't click immediately, um, because it requires some out of the box thinking. Now, if I just could click here. So that's uh, me in the corporate world. I'm a senior manager in the AI center of excellence in the CTO office at Red Hat. I'm working remotely out of Kiel, Germany, and I'm looking into Red Hat's AI strategy. Um, and for three years, I've been working on the topic of AI ops and now with Operate First, also on the topic of, of operations. On the internet, obviously, you have to be a little bit cooler. So that's my tag name, Do Random. Um, and I call myself an old school open source hacker and demon zombie slayer. And you old guys that actually um, try, or the, you young guys also, I don't think it's a matter of age. It's just how close you are at the processes. You know what demons and uh, zombies are. So. And that's where we also need to go back to, right? So it all started back in the days with Unix when we had these old mainframes where you basically bought a room full of silicon, full of machines. And what you got handed was a green screen monitor with a huge manual to program the machine. But you could only program the machine. You could not actually change the machine or change the hardware or change the operating system. So that happened um, when communities were founded around Linux, around open source software. And that these were founded because people wanted to tinker with the machines wanted to tinker with the operating system, wanted to improve and add features to it. So that's this typical user to contributor funnel that we have in open source software. So typically you have a user or 100 users that love your software, that love your operating system. And then they start having issues with your uh, with your software. So out of these 100 users, you have 10 users that are not content or that experience a bug and they open an issue with you. And then maybe out of these 10 users, you have one user actually fixing this issue because he cannot wait until the issue is being fixed or he has a real interest in, in doing this. And then he becomes a contributor. So out of 100, maybe you get uh, 10 people reporting back and one pe person being a contributor. And with that funnel, it's, it's basically like a sales funnel. You want to have as large as a community as possible so that everybody can use your stuff so that eventually you're standing on the shoulders of your community. And it's not just on you to support this stuff anymore, but you can do it as a community. And it's not just about reporting bugs. It's also obviously about um, driving the feature set of that software and driving, shaping the future of that software. And although it started in, yeah, at, at universities and, and, and in, in, in the private sector, no, in the, not the private sector, but in <laughs> with private people doing stuff in their, in their, um, in their spare time. Nowadays, most of the open source software is actually being is driven by people that are being paid for it. So we changed the default model for writing software for um, 
sorry. For writing software and for collaboration to the open source way. That's a matter of fact. But recently something changed. So in the age of cloud, I think, and a lot of other folks also think so, that it's suddenly more important to operate software than the actual software itself. Databases are ubiquitous. Um, you can go to your hyperscaler, to your cloud provider and order compute, order a queuing service, right? So a lot of folks, a lot of people are thinking in services, are thinking in, um, yeah, in commoditized software. And somebody has to make sure that the software is up to up and running. This year's a tweet from an cloud and open source executive at AWS. And he posed the question, what actually happens if you open source everything? And that's, uh, he came up with this example from that uh, Jagabyte company, which had a software and they open sourced it and um, that was great. And they, because they realized that the software doesn't really have a soft, uh, that uh, the software doesn't really have a value if people cannot use the software. So are they really open sourcing everything? Although the whole software stack of the, of the, of the database that they are, uh, that they have is open and, and free for inspection, the platform where it runs, that's not open. So everything in the cloud world in the as a service world is everything but the service itself. So how do I get this contributor funnel for something running as a service or the operations, right? So if you want to, and, and software as a service is by definition, some software that you offer as a service and the added value to that is your operations. And that contributor funnel is being essentially tried out because yes, you can say I have a fix and you can uh, meet at Stack Overflow how to work around that fix. And maybe you can even uh, open an issue with the provider of that service, but you cannot contribute something back in terms of operational code. So if the value in IT is in operations and operations are proprietary, then open source has a problem. And all operations are proprietary by default, right? Because you have private data in your logs, in your metrics, in your configuration. So I don't know of any corporation or of any um, cloud that is, yeah, getting people in the internet or to even for researchers access to their production cloud setups or their production environments. And operate first is something intended to fix that. So operate first is a concept to incorporate operational experience. That means how you operate stuff, how you operate that software into the software development cycle itself by extending the development to include operating, testing, and providing code in a production environment. In essence, that means shift left and work with your developers, work with your ops guys to make the software itself more operable so that it becomes easier to operate the software and therefore encapsulate and ship that operational excellence with the software itself to the users. Ideally operate first becomes a partner to upstream first as a basic tenet of our workflow. That's uh, upstream first is the, the workflow that Red Hat operates by, but also a lot of other companies are operating by. That means basically every single line of code should make it into the upstream project so that we don't have uh, a, a gap between the 
upstream code and the productized version. So you don't want to have a fork of something because that increases the maintenance burden and that uh, has a lot of bad side effects. Um, and obviously the better side effect is that you're not sharing their stuff with others. So you deviate from your upstream community and essentially at some point you're in, um, yeah, you're not the same project as upstream anymore. But still the question remains, how do we do something like this with something that is not software, that is not a line of code, but it's encaptured in the operational experience, in the minds of the people, in data, right? So let's look back what open source made software or what open source made to free um, it's from the chains of pro proprietary ex enslavement <laughs> basically how do could we turn users into contributors it meant that we had a read only access to all the data it meant that we have a read only access to all the source code so we have to have something similar for operations that means have read access to all the config files to all the um, metrics logs and all the stuff being produced and accumulated while running such an environment. It also means that we must be super, super inclusive in terms of onboarding, not only your customers, the projects that uh, will come to you as a cloud provider, but also in terms of contributors. And contributors start at a different level of of experience and uh, at a different level of what they want to do. So you have these power users that want to dig right into the core of something, or you have these beginners um, that just want to get practice and, and get some learning experience with the software itself or with um, how to operate software, right? And that's, you remember that maybe from some projects would have some uh, nice to start labels on issues or getting, yeah, getting started um, um, issues or where you have really community architects, community uh, people selecting stuff, how to, how to grow that community. So that in the end, you go from reading something, reading uh, source code, reading issues, reporting issues, and then resolving issues. So we want to create a community that is inclusive to all personas. It's inclusive to the people that operate the cloud. It's inclusive to those who develop workloads on the cloud or that develop the cloud stack itself, meaning Kubernetes these days or something on the Linux layer. It must be inclusive to the users so that we get as many users as possible for running their workloads there. It can include product supporters. So if we see a problem in in that in that in that um, open source cloud environment. Um, we can replicate that same problem into a commercial support, or maybe you have a commercial supporter that uh, that also does uh, some community support in his spare time. You have architects using these lego building blocks to develop something new and now suddenly they have a place to host their long living reference architectures instead of have, setting something up for a customer or for a demo and then tearing it down again and then half a year later coming back to, uh, just to realize that it doesn't work anymore now you could have a long running demo running in such an open cloud environment and Hopefully, finally, we also please our AI overlords, uh, feed them all the data, and then we can do all the good stuff and the cloud will be operated by machines. So finally, or in one sentence, what we want to build or what's the implement, that's the implementation of that operate first mentality. So we need to have a cloud with full visibility into the operations center. And that cloud can be anywhere. And it's really in the broadest definition of cloud. It's not just uh, something in, in, in a real cloud environment, but you can also have a hybrid cloud where you have something running on-premise. It could even 
extend out to the edge. It could even extend out to your small Raspberry Pi running in the in the cellar. So some um, communities are doing something like this already. So the home automation community has a lot of a lot of uh, user contributed hardware, um, which is really uh, which has a real ha a huge variety. So that you have this this primordial soup of of ideas challenging each other. So really cloud here is a synonym of all the stuff that we can do to operate machines and stacks in a forward looking fashion. That was the philosophical background. And that's something that we've talked about for some time. And since uh, almost a year now, or maybe three quarters of a year, we're also we're really growing in a, a community doing this, and we have an actual environment for doing stuff. So let's get real. The first setup is at the MOC, which is the Mass Open Cloud. It's not the Massachusetts Cloud Open Cloud anymore, but it's hosted at the Boston University. So. Um, in this beautiful city, which we're virtually now having that conference here. Uh, there's a data center and there are some racks with some donated machines, um, which are quite beefy. Um, so it's in the ballpark of 300 CPU cores and three terabytes of RAM. So like really nine node clusters um, on bare metal. So you have a Kubernetes slash OpenShift environment um, running on these machines. And we have another setup at Hetzner in Germany, which is something like a rec space, which is a small environment, but it's in another geo. And we have clusters running on AWS, which are managed by that environment. As a matter of fact, the workshop, which is now running, um, which is about how to do cloud native data science is running in an operate first environment, which is hosted on AWS set up just in a couple of days to a fun fully functional environment because we had all the recipes available. And in the future, we're working to get more and more providers connected to that environment. So it's really multi-geo, multi, um, yeah, multi-hardware, what do you say? It's, it's a hybrid cloud, it's, it's a hybrid cloud environment. And on top of that, we have obviously workloads. So as the most prominent workload, we have this Open Data Hub initiative or this Open Data Hub project, which is a collection of tools for doing AI and machine learning and data engineering on top of Kubernetes. We have projects like Apicurio or Quarkus or Pulp hosting workloads in that environment. We have set up some management and automation tools. So we have advanced cluster manager, which is in, as a matter of fact, uh, the productized version of the OCM stuff that my previous speaker talked about. So that's already somewhat included in that environment. We have Argo seed for, and we use that for setting up clusters and main, uh, running, maintaining clusters. We use Argo CD for deployment of workloads and configuration management of the clusters themselves. We use Prow from the Kubernetes and uh, com from the Kubernetes communities to do CI/CD testing. We use Tecton pipelines, etc. And we try to treat everything as a service. So Open Data Hub is being treated as a service. You come can come to it as a user and just use Open Data Hub resources. We have Kafka, so you can just use Kafka. We have Prometheus and Loki for your monitoring um, and data dashboard needs. And you can actually install or work with us installing every operator, every um, community operator out there and get it installed in that cluster. Although it might break the cluster, but then we figured out that it might break the cluster. So we're giving something back. And operators are that notion of encapsulated operational excellence into a piece of code. And obviously, we want to create operational data sets, because data 
is everything these days. So all the alerts, all the issues, all the logs, all the metrics, everything that we produce while setting up these clusters and running these clusters is collected for posterity, posterity so that we can train machine learning models on top of that. On top of that. And that's really, that's the, the, the longest running question that I, ha that I have since I'm working in that space. Where can I get a decent data set for my machine learning stuff? That was always the longest running question. And I think now we're coming to a, now we, we're getting to a situation where we can actually create useful data sets. And obviously using that for community building. So community, where are we right now? These are pretty recent numbers um, as of yesterday, the 1st of September, we have about 26 repositories in the Operate First organization. We have 108 individual external contributors and we have 26 internal contributors. So the most, that's already pretty um, inclusive, I would say. We measured that by, or we decided who's internal and external, not just by company affiliation, but it's uh, who is part of the Operate First team in GitHub and who has direct or who can we assign issues and tickets to those 26 folks are mostly people by from red from red hat it's mostly people from the ai CVE or people that um that i manage but um but we're growing right and we're trying to get more and more folks into it in terms of issues created over time, you see that there's, then we're, we're going to the upper right corner. That's what you want to see on every chart, right? <laughs> and in 2000, beginning this year, 2021, we broke the 200 issues barrier. So that's issues created per month. So, and you might ask what kind of issues are these? Are these issues opened by machines like alerts or incidents? No, it's um, actual issues that are um, created by humans. And if we look at the repositories here, it's that the apps repository and the support repository here, I don't know if you see my mouse, the, um, the support repository get the most attention. Obviously that's because the apps repository is our Git app, Git ops repository where all the configuration is created. So every user request probably also results in a change to that repository and the support repository is just there for finding user support. So if somebody has a question or somebody wants to onboard, they're going to that repository and create issues there. And the orange color here identifying the number of external, external people creating issues here. It's, an, it's a nice indicator that uh, we also get external folks doing um they're yeah, doing git ops in in that organization so reusing the infrastructure that we provide in terms of contributors to these issues it looks just the other way around obviously so the it's 13 percent of the issues are um, worked on by external people and 86% of the issues are being worked on by internal people, which is also, uh, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's obvious that it's going this way and probably it's, it will be like most of the time, hopefully this is, is something that it's, it, it, it's a trajectory that we also carry on because maybe you want to, um, 
include most of the people into your community. So I don't know if this external internal split even makes sense forward looking. Um, I don't know what these are some first good numbers. So 26 uh, at the end call to action. You just I don't want you to go away with nothing, but I want you to go and try out stuff. So go to the operate first dot cloud website. And you will see here two buttons two call to action buttons button buttons. If you are an open source developer, and that means if you are running some of your projects, uh, or if you're if you're if you're developing projects that can run in a cloud native environment, or if you're working on components that are that are making up Kubernetes, you can go there and deploy some of your operators in that environment. You can deploy some of your workloads into that environment, and that takes you by the hand and explains how you get some of your workloads deployed on operate first. If you want to help operating these workloads, or if you want to see how these workloads are being operated, if you want to dip your toes into SRE best practices, this is the other path that you can follow. Click that button and we take you to the back office where you see all the good stuff that I was talking about um, and where you can ask questions and collaborate. Asking question means collaborating. So in the upper right corner, there's these nice little icons that everybody knows, the cat from GitHub, the Slack icon for chatting and the YouTube icon for re-watching some of the sprint meetings that we did or some of the, the, the bits and pieces that we published on YouTube. There's also a mailing list that I urge you to, to, to subscribe. And if you just go there and subscribe to the mailing list so that you get updates into your old fashioned SN, SMTP port 25 box delivered to stay up to date. That's it. Thank you. Two minutes for questions. Let me see if I see some. No questions. That's that's sad. Yes, you will find me in the breakout room. I guess. I hope so. Maybe you find me in the breakdown room. Actually, I'm uh, here in EMEA, so it's 5.30 for me. Um, I'm not sure if I will stay long in the breakout room, but I click on this right now. All right. Just one question. Can we build an event out of this content, a way to learn by doing? Yes, that's great. And uh, we are curating a lot of this content that we have there. There will be a webinar. I don't have a URL for it, but uh, monitor the Linux Foundation website of their webinars. It will be on the 5th of October, somewhere on the internet, where we have a cooking show for how to do stuff there. And we will have workshops longer workshops at defconf zz and in the in the future how to do this so there's already an awful lot of content it's not in the best shape because it's yeah it's created by by doers and it's created bottoms up so if you want to participate in shaping that content or you consuming that content and then feedback by uh, suggestions that's always appreciated All right. Thank you so much for coming to talk, Marcel. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Okay.